men, praise the Lord, and we're certainly enjoying some lovely weather. Uh, a little dry, perhaps, but uh, we will ask the Lord to send the rain during the nighttime when it can bless all of our plants and things like that. Praise the Lord. All right, so this morning we're starting a new section, and uh, we are beginning to look at, in Acts, the last chapters in Acts, Acts, starting actually at verse 13 and working our way to the end of Acts, uh, looking at the growth of the church, and the way there was also often persecution uh, at that time, there's no question about that, but how the church grew regardless. And so I'm going to ask you to join me in turning in your Bibles to Acts, I'm going to start at Acts chapter 11. A few verses in Acts chapter 11, then one in Acts chapter 12, until we get to Acts chapter 13, where our lesson actually begins. The reason I'm going back a little bit, we're taking a look this morning at the ministry of Barnabas and Paul. And um, much of Acts prior to this section actually focuses on the ministry of Peter. And so if you read the first chapters of Acts, you will see a lot about uh, the Lord moving and working through Peter. And it's not until we get now more into some of these middle chapters that we start to hear more about Paul and Barnabas. Now, when it speaks about Paul and Barnabas and their ministry, they were often not alone in their ministry. Uh, there's reference to other apostles and other people that were helping them uh, and going along with them. But they were, I guess, the, the leaders in what the Lord wanted them to do. And uh, they did a lot of work and often it was, involved a lot of traveling. Um, in, in, in that day, of course, the center of... Uh, the Christian faith and the churches were often in Jerusalem, but today we're going to start reading about Antioch. Um, and that, of course, is where um, historically and scripturally uh, the Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. Um, and so we'll take a look at that as well. Um, and I will point out to you just to start here that similar to today where you have cities that might have the same name, there's more than one Antioch in Scripture. And so uh, when we read the Scripture, we have to look very carefully. It's similar sometimes, you know, how and you're going to, we're going to see this morning, um, the particular chapters we're reading refer to Saul. And then, you know, later on in, in one part of Scripture, it will put in brackets that this is also the one named Paul. All right, so when you see that this morning, when it talks about Barnabas and Saul... It's also actually referring to Barnabas and Paul. So we're more familiar at this stage with him being called Paul. So in Acts chapter 11, uh, let's just take a look at some of what Barnabas and Saul, it refers to him there this way, uh, what they were up to. Uh, so in Acts chapter 11, beginning at verse 25. So here um, we see, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus, for to seek Saul. So Saul was already out doing ministry. Paul was already out doing ministry. And um, Barnabas went to find him. Verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man to, according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it by the elders to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So, uh, as we know, and I've mentioned many times, Scripture will travel through time rather quickly, okay, uh, at certain points. And so what we see here, Barnabas goes to find Saul, he goes to Tarsus, that would have taken 
a, a length of time to do. They then return to uh, Antioch. And the Antioch being referred to here is what um, we scripturally will see often referred to as Syrian Antioch. So there's an Antioch, the one that we're most familiar with, in Syria. And if you were to look at a map, um, basically we're talking north of what is now Jerusalem, just along the coast. Um, there's still the city there, they've changed the name, it's no longer called Antioch. Uh, but that is the Antioch that is being referred to here. It was a really important city, and you know historically that's a good thing for us to know because the Lord will often work in some of the major metropolis kind of areas. And at the time of the Roman Empire, this Antioch being spoken of here was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Okay. Rome being the largest, and then the Alexandria and Antioch in this area of the world were the largest cities population-wise. Right? And they tended to be strategic for military, and they were also uh, you know, places for trade and commerce. Um, and so that's what Antioch was. And um, by the time we see reference to Antioch in the scriptures here, this is now already hundreds of years since the establishment of that particular community. All right? And you can read about, I did some reading this, this past week, about the history of Antioch and who founded it and all of those different things. Yeah, I'm interested in that kind of thing, but it was interesting to note. And so they come back to Antioch, and it says that they assembled themselves with the church there and taught for a whole year. Now, Antioch was divided into quarters. And so uh, today you might hear reference sometimes to a community having like a Latin quarter or, or you know, a section of the city where people tended to congregate that were of the same faith or the same language. We see the same today. Right? You can go to Toronto, you can go to different, actually, uh, we had to drive through downtown Kitchener for the ODEC conference yesterday to get to where that was. You know, when you drive through a section of the community, then you see a lot of signs in different languages, right? Which means that people of different cultural background are gathering together and they find each other, okay? Um, and so in Toronto, you have Chinatown and you have different parts of this, the communities that are divided. Well, that same thing was happening then, all right? And in Antioch, there was what was considered to be a Jewish quarter. So there were, was a high percentage of population of Jewish background. They spoke in that language, and they gathered together in their synagogue, and that's where Barnabas and Paul would minister and would teach, and that's, of course, where Christianity um, was flourishing, it was growing there, all right? Um, and at that time, as you could see, right, then a prophetic word from Jerusalem comes to Antioch, basically telling the people in Antioch that there's going to be, as it says here, a, a great dearth, okay? So there's going to be an economic downturn. There's going to be a, a time of struggle. And as you read there in verse 29, the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief. So they gathered an offering together, what they could, everyone based on what they could. And now that had to go back to Judea, it had to go back to the church, to the prophets, to the people in that part of the world. And Barnabas and Saul were chosen for that particular task. I just give you that background because we see that Barnabas and Saul were often working together, okay? So, uh, you know, and I believe the Lord knows uh, what combinations are good for each other and how to bring people together uh, and what is needed. And so Barnabas and Saul seem to work well. There's reference in the scripture of, of John Mark joining them at one point in time, uh, but then he leaves them. And there's no explanation in that part of the scripture, but if you read later on, Paul makes reference to him in saying that he basically deserted them. All right? So, 
relationships weren't always perfect. And there were sometimes struggles, it would appear, even among the disciples, right? And some could handle maybe the pressure or the persecution better than others. And so, you know, there were sometimes they got together and they traveled together, and then there were times when they parted ways. And it wasn't always maybe under the best circumstances. But, you know, as God's people, we look at this, and what we see this morning is the leading of the Holy Spirit is really what they needed to have and what we need to have today. So they didn't do anything successfully unless the Holy Spirit was the one that was telling them, now's the time to go. These are the people to go. And we'll see a little bit about how that happens. So Barnabas and Saul go now to, it says, in Judea. They take this offering with them. All right, so they were obviously trusted, and they go and they do that. Now you jump with me to chapter 12, and I just want to read uh, one verse, the last verse in chapter 12, verse 25, and it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. Okay, so we saw they went with the offering. Now they're returning from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Okay, so now they come from Jerusalem, John Mark accompanies them from Jerusalem, and they're returning. Returning to where? They're returning to Antioch. Okay? Because that's where they, they came from. They went, they took the offering, they brought John Mark back with them, and they came back to Antioch. Alright, now let's pick it up in chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas, and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And I'm going to just stop there for a minute, because what we see here is that the church in Antioch was benefiting by many uh, evangelists, apostles, disciples, prophets, that were coming and teaching there in their midst. All right? So this was a prosperous place to be. It was a good place to be. And I, I highlight that because sometimes when we get into those good places to be, we don't want to leave. Sometimes we get into a very comfortable sort of situation. Okay? Antioch was a comfortable place for the disciples and the prophets and God's people to be. And so they were putting down roots there. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as when the Lord tells us or tells these people, which we're going to see, it's time to move, then we have to be willing to hear and we have to be willing to listen. Okay? And I liken this a little bit to my journey in education. When I started as a teacher, I started in a school, and as a first-year teacher, you get the worst room. I was out in a portable, back in the, back in the foothills, so to speak, right? You don't get the assignments that you want, any of those kind of things. After 10 years of being in the same school, I had the classroom I wanted. I, had the, I was teaching what I wanted to teach. I was coaching the sports that I wanted to coach. I was on the committees that I wanted to be on. And then my principal at the time said, if you want to keep growing, if you want to keep moving forward, you need to leave. That was a difficult time. And actually, um, people that have shared this with, that first year after I went to a new school, I almost quit teaching. It was the most terrible year of my entire career. Okay. And maybe that was because it was all new and it was unsettling to me. I don't know what it was, but I didn't enjoy it. I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. It didn't feel right. Uh, there were uh, multiple lists. I didn't like the administration. There were all kinds of things, reasons why it was the most terrible time for me. And I share that with you because, you see, we can get stuck in a rut. All of us. And it's difficult sometimes, and we don't always acknowledge it, when that happens, because it's a comfortable place to be. But we have to be open, and I have to also be open, to the Spirit's moving, right? 
Change isn't always good for the sake of change. I'm not talking about that. But when the Spirit is speaking and leading, we all, myself also, we have to accept that. And sometimes I struggle with that. right? And, and then I have to ask the Lord to help me with that. And the reason is we get comfortable. Okay? And here, this sort of Christian community in Antioch was very comfortable, right? This was the church to be. Look at all of these big, highfalutin evangelists and people are coming and teaching. And that was good. It was good teaching, all right? And the church was strong. But what we see here in our title this morning, the gospel proclamation to Jews and Gentiles, was that God was then saying to this church, now you're strong, but I want that strength to spread. Okay? I don't want it to just be here in this one place. I want it to spread. I'm going to share this little analogy. Stephanie and I were talking about it yesterday. We, I personally feel we, we listened to a very good message yesterday at our conference, at the Ovid conference. And the one gentleman, he was talking about uh, revitalization and growth of the church and different things like that, and I won't preach the message. But he did show two images. And I think, and I want you to pray and think about this because I think it certainly touched me. And he said it was a powerful thing that many people would speak to him about. That was something that they really were praying about or needed to pray about. He said, and the, the two images were a frog and a lizard. Okay? The frog is like the church that sits around and waits for the flies to come to them. Right? Because that's how frogs, that's how frogs hunt. Right? They sit really still, they don't move, they don't do anything, and they just sit there on their lily pad or on the log or whatever it happens to be, and they wait for the fly to come to them and then catch them. Okay. The lizard, on the other hand, goes hunting for the flies. The lizard is an example of there are other animals we could use. But he, as that particular creature, isn't designed to just sit still necessarily. All right? He goes hunting. He goes to where the flies are and he captures them there. All right? And this particular pastor yesterday was suggesting that many churches need to change their mindset a little bit. We've been used to because the country was a Christian country. And children learned about God in school, and many children went to school, and there were the majority of families at least attended church once in a while, right? And so churches used to be like the frog. Didn't have to do too much. The flies would come to the frog. Okay? You see, you understand the analogy that, that was being painted here, right? Christians would come to the church, and then... You could get them saved there, right? You could teach them about the Lord. But they come on their own, right? But now we live in a society that has changed. That's no longer the case, right? You don't have in a classroom anymore, and I haven't been teaching now for six, seven years anymore, but certainly the majority of kids, even when I was in a Christian area in the country at a school, even there, many of the students never went to church. They didn't know anything about that, okay? And so they would never think to go to a church. And so you can't wait necessarily anymore for the flies to come to the frog. We have to become more like the lizards, okay? And really, the reason I'm sharing this with you, and I ask you to pray about that, because that's an interesting thing for all of us to think about. It talks about our testimony and all those things. Really, the Bible speaks about being lizards all the time, in that sense. And we see that here, I think, with what's happening in the church in Antioch. Okay? Prospering church, growing church, comfortable place to be, a great place for Barnabas and Saul to teach. No persecution, really. It was all comfortable there in Antioch, right? And it says in verse 2, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul 
for the work whereunto I have called them. Now that's a really, really important verse. Okay? Let me start with the last part of the verse. For the work whereunto I have called them. You see, every one of us needs to make sure we're on the right track with regards to the work that God has called us to do. Okay? And I don't believe that you can sit there in a pew and say that God hasn't called you to do some work for Him. Every Christian, God has called to do something for them. Something, right? Some form of outreach, praying for someone, showing kindness. Again, this pastor gave examples, right? It wasn't church organized, but people would notice, well, some new people moved into the neighborhood. Let's put together a welcome basket for them. Let's go to them. Let's show kindness to them, right? Let's invite them to the church. You're new to the neighborhood. You're new to the area. Are you looking, you know, do you need a church to attend? Come on out, you know, and, and bring your family with you, right? It wasn't something that the church necessarily organized. It was something the Christians were doing, right? And they're, they're, they're sharing the gospel, living the life, and in doing so, doing what the Lord had called them to do. All of us, the Lord has called all of us to share the gospel. Right? And that doesn't necessarily start with only preaching at somebody. It talks about, you know, it involves knowing your neighbors. It involves praying for your neighbors. Even if they give you a hard time. Right? All of those things eventually leading to a, a time when you can talk to that person and invite them to know the Lord as their Savior. And if we're too comfortable, we don't think about that, right? And, and I, can, I can see myself getting trapped in that. Very much so. Easy, right? It's nice to be a frog sitting in the pond. It's nice, it's comfortable, I have my own pond. Nobody bothers me here. There's no predators here. That's great. And every once in a while, a fly comes by and I can grab them. But the flies are getting less frequent. And so the frog maybe has to stretch its limbs a little bit and move and find where those flies are. And here, you see, Saul and Barnabas are called for the work whereunto I, the Lord is speaking, I you know, for the work whereunto I have called them. I can imagine Barnabas and Saul maybe saying, well, wait a minute, Lord. What have we been doing here all this time? Aren't we doing your work here? They've been teaching, right? And I'm sure they were doing the work there. But see, the Lord spoke specifically through the Holy Spirit. It was time for them to stretch. It was time for them to move. It was time for them to do a different work. And then, of course, the key part to that is that it's the Holy Ghost that's speaking. And how did they come about to arrive at what should we be doing? It happens because we see at the beginning of that verse, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, so fasting is a critical piece. It's a critical piece because, and it is something that it, in many churches and many Christians have lost, but it is that focus, really. It is that opportunity to be focused and really intently seeking the Lord, not allowing other things to distract, so that we can then wait upon the Lord and hear from Him. Hear from Him. Right? And that's what was happening here. The Lord spoke to the church. The Lord spoke to Saul and Barnabas. And then the next step is critical too. Okay, We see again fasting and prayer, verse 3. And when they had fasted and prayed, that's now speaking about the church. Okay? When the church had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now, why is that so important? That's really important because sometimes we don't like to share. And when I say we, I'm talking about the church. Okay? And that is, you know, let, let's just back up a little bit. 
the church is prospering, the church is growing, the church is comfortable, all right? You have, God has placed people in positions where they are doing a good job. All of that is wonderful, right? But imagine then that the Lord says, and I'm not talking about me now, but imagine you're in a church, you have uh, uh, an amazing pastor, and, and you're getting all the teaching that you need, and then the Holy Spirit speaks to the pastor, and then the Holy Spirit speaks to the church, and says, you have to let this pastor go. I'm sending him someplace else. Not everyone is going to be interested in letting that happen. Because, well, wait a minute, what about us? What about us? We don't want to lose that musician. We don't want to lose that family. We don't want to lose, you know, that Sunday school teacher. We need them here. Sure, I can understand that. But this is, again, where it's so critical. If God says, I'm calling so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so for a specific work, then we all need to hear that. And that was what we see here, okay? They all heard it. And we see that in verse 3, because again, they did some more praying. They did some more fasting. And we don't know how long, right? It doesn't tell me they prayed for one night, or one week, or one month. We don't know that period of time. We just know they did it until they were certain that this is what the Holy Spirit was directing them to do. And when they were certain, they bless Barnabas and Saul. They send them on their way with their blessing, not grumbling and complaining, right? Not saying, oh, you shouldn't be going, you know, not, not somebody in the congregation pulling them aside and, hey, Barnabas and Saul, I don't know. I don't think this is what you should be doing. Right? No. As a body, remember this, this church speaks about how we're supposed to be in unity in the spirit. As a body, they all came to one place so that they could all send them away. They laid hands on them, they prayed for them, they blessed them, and then they sent them away. So they, verse 4, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. Okay, even though the church said, we, we thank the Lord and we, we send you on your way, the real approval came from the Holy Spirit. Okay? And they go on their way. It says, departing unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And then when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their ministry. So that's referring back again to John Mark. Right, that we saw in the previous chapter, who came with them to Antioch, he also goes with them on at least this first part of the journey. Right, and and you know I would encourage you because I think it brings it to life a little bit, <clears throat> and I'm going to work really hard at getting a screen up here, not so that I can show you all kinds of stuff that you don't want to see, but I think it's important, it's interesting to see. Here's where Antioch is was, and here's where they had to sail, and here's where they went from there, right? I mean, do you know where Cyprus is relative to Jerusalem, to Judea, okay? Do you know where they traveled to and what it must have taken? Cyprus is an island, right? So, I mean, they went by boat, and then they came back to this to the sea, uh, sorry, to land after crossing through Cyprus, and then the next part of the scripture talks about some challenges that they had and some evil, uh, talks about sorcerer, etc. Our lesson skips over that because we want to keep moving. Jump down to verse 13, same chapter. It says, Now when Paul and his company loosed from uh, Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So there's that reference. All of a sudden, John leaves them. Okay? And we don't know here why, but later on, like I said, um, Paul makes reference to the fact that uh, he deserted them, that John Paul deserted them. So probably wasn't a good departure at that point, okay? So, but they're still traveling. Verse 14, but when they had departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. 
Now, you have to notice that, right? That's not the same Antioch they left from. This is now Antioch in Pisidia. So I did not have a clue. I don't know, does anybody, I won't, don't put your hands up. Anybody know where Antioch in Pisidia is? I had no idea where that was, right? So I, I looked, and, and so I don't know how good you are knowing your geography, but if you think about Turkey today, okay, modern Turkey today, so it's, you know, on the eastern sort of uh, corner of the Mediterranean to the north, um, across from Greece, uh, sort of, okay, is all Turkey. Much of what we read in the Bible, like Ephesus and Galatia and all those places are in what today we call modern-day Turkey, okay? And they've changed their name a little bit too now. I think it's Turkai that they like to be called. They've changed the spelling. But anyway, my point is that this particular Antioch is sort of, is basically smack in the middle of what today we refer to, I refer to as Turkey. Okay? So they've traveled inland, and they've gone north, basically. And they end up in this particular Antioch, which again, historically, a tremendous area for agriculture. Um, it's considered to be, it's nestled, it's surrounded by lakes. Okay? So it was a very prosperous, uh, again, a sort of a hub of culture, uh, sort of a community, not anywhere near as big, as the other Antioch, but that's where they end up. So they've traveled a fair bit, and what do they do, which was always Paul's, you know, we see over and over again, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And I like this piece, it, it just sort of, it was, my attention was drawn to their behavior here. So they go to the synagogue, they found a church, I hope you do the same, right? You go on a holiday, you travel abroad, you find some place where you can worship, all right? So they went to a church and they sat down. They basically became part of the congregation. They just sat in a pew or sat down on whatever they were. They had to sit. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So you see, there is an etiquette that we see here, okay? So they came in as visitors. They were obviously recognized. Somebody recognized them, right? But they sat through the service, the readings of the word, the reading of, you know, the sort of the proceedings there, and they, not until they were invited to share, did they take their liberty to do so, okay? And, and I think this is also an important piece of our um, missionary work in Preston or wherever it happens to be. You see, people know you. They should know you. They should know you, right? And we can certainly offer, but it's so much more powerful if somebody invites us to share about the gospel, you know? Like, and that's not to say that you don't, sit, you know, you say, you know, I'm praying for you, if you'd like to sit down and chat sometime, or anything like that. Those invitations are, are fine. I, I think that's great. We should all be doing that. But the most powerful interaction happens when somebody asks you for help, right? And so here they were invited. I don't think that the rulers in this particular synagogue were prepared for what God was going to give through Paul and Barnabas, right? Because what the next part, the, the sort of the message, is not something they wanted to hear, okay? They weren't really pleased with this, because when we read on here, Paul now begins in verse 16, and he says, and then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. And I just want to draw quickly to your attention, he points out really two specific groups, if you want to say that. And the reason this is important is because, as our title of our lesson this morning, is the proclamation of the gospel to the Jews, to the Jewish people, and to the Gentiles. Okay? So this church actually um, 
had already taken some steps in that sense. All right, and I, I underline here because he makes specific reference to the men of Israel. That would be the Jewish people in the crowd, and then he says, "And ye that fear God," he sort of creates another grouping there. Okay, and and that in itself may have upset some of those people that would have said, "I'm a man of Israel." You see, just because they were people of Israel doesn't mean that they were serving God or that they would fear God. The title means nothing, right? It's just like today. I can say, oh, and a lot of people say, I'm a Christian. What does that mean? Unless that's somebody who also fears God. Unless that's somebody who also obeys the will of God. Then just saying you're a Christian, that's not a ticket into heaven. That's not your salvation to say, I'm a Christian. And it was the same then, right? So people, they kind of would automatically assume, well, I'm Jewish. Well, so what? What does that mean in the sight of, of God, right? And so it's interesting, and Paul makes this differentiation a few times as he's ministering, right? You know, and, and it's almost like saying, imagine this. If a pastor came in and he said, Good morning, all of you Christians and all of you that are saved. Oh. You mean not all of the Christians are necessarily saved? Or it might be better if, if the pastor came in and said, All of you that call yourselves Christians and all of you that are born again, good morning. Okay. Not necessarily the same thing. And Paul hits that right away and speaks to that. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to jump a little bit here. He basically goes through a historical account, okay, if you read the next verses, and he talks about, you know, how God brought them, the children of Israel, out of Egypt and delivered them and those kind of things. He gives all that, speaks about David, King David, and all the Lord has done. He does all of that so that he can bring them to Jesus. So that he can bring them to the part where it speaks about Jesus the Savior. And then he has a message of salvation. All right? Um, if you go down to verse 26, he says again, men and, children, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God. Again, see, he talks about just your heritage isn't going to save you. But the fear of the Lord is, is critical. Right? And, and so, you know, just saying you, you go to Bethel Tabernacle, or my parents went to Bethel Tabernacle, or my kids saying, well, my dad's a pastor, that doesn't do anything for them as far as salvation is concerned. Okay? So we have to make sure we have, in a sense, I'm going to say the proper credentials, all right, that come from the Lord not from some natural institution or something that you might hang on the word on the wall. To you is the word of this salvation sent. Okay? And so he speaks of salvation and he preaches now on salvation and he really uh, pro he makes the Jewish population in particular here uncomfortable. Okay? And again, we don't like it we don't, I don't know, I don't purposely wake up in the morning and say, I want to be uncomfortable today. I don't, I don't usually do that. I like being comfortable, right? But the uncomfortableness that comes from the word of the Lord, that's a really good thing. That's similar, I guess, to saying to the frog, get going, get off the lily pad. It's time for you to do something in order to, you know, go after the sheep. You know, and then, of course, the idea here, you know, Jesus talked about, I'm leaving the 99 behind because I'm going after the one. Okay? Because every one is critical, is, is valuable, and is sought after by the Lord. Right? And, and so, you know, he makes the Jewish people uncomfortable. He talks about, if you go down... Uh, let me just read from verse 27. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, 
nor yet the voice of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. So he's talking about what the Jewish organized religion did to Jesus. And he was probably talking to a lot of the same people in that crowd. Okay. Just because they were Jewish people that had left Israel, <laughs> left Jerusalem, left Judea, and moved to Antioch, doesn't mean that they had left behind all of the false religion and false doctrines that they had been taught before. Okay? And just before, because they were in a synagogue or in a church, doesn't mean they were automatically saved. So Paul is reminding them uh, that what the Jewish people did with their persecution to Christ. And they didn't like to hear that. They didn't want to hear that. He continues to preach. Um, and uh, you, can, you can kind of read, and he kind of nails it on the head a lot of times. I want to jump down to verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So it was a mixed crowd, in a sense, okay? And then actually in verse 43, Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So the message didn't stop in the church. It continued outside of the church, all right? Um, verse 42 just bringing this to your, uh, recognizing this. Notice it says, might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Okay? So my mind would automatically say, oh, it was a Sabbath day. They came and they said, we're inviting you back. Come back and preach to us some more on the next Sunday. Okay? Actually, the literal translation, if you go back to the original text, says more like, and in my Bible it clarifies this, it says more of in the week between the Sabbaths. Okay. So what the Gentile population was saying to Barnabas and Saul, uh, can you share more about the Lord with us tomorrow? We don't want to wait until next Sunday or next Saturday. We don't want to wait until the next Sabbath. What about Tuesday? Can we get together on Tuesday too? Hey, can we have a midweek service on Wednesday? Because we, we are hungry. See, these people were hungry for the Lord. And you, we, we use this analogy all the time. You don't eat just once a week. I don't see anybody here who looks like they eat just once a week. I don't. Naturally, I'm talking, right? So definitely, if we're hungering for the Lord, why wait a whole week until you get some more? Okay? And the Gentiles in particular here points them out. And it does say in verse 43, many of the Jews, so some of the Jewish people were also feeling that power of conversion, feeling that power of salvation. When it speaks about religious proselytes, do you know what a religious proselyte is? Okay, well don't feel bad if you don't. But a religious proselyte, as referenced here, was a Gentile converted to Judaism. Okay? So uh, that was happening, right? The Gentiles, um, and because uh, Juda Judaism was so linked to ancestral uh, Jews, okay? you had to be born of the stock of Abraham, etc., 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 then people who were not, so Greek, people of Greek culture, or you know, what would today be Iran or, or Iraq or Turkey, any of these different cultural groups, if they wanted to be part of the synagogue, they had to become part of the Jewish faith. And so they were referred to as religious proselytes. And then they had to go through all of the Jewish traditions and requirements, okay? So all of those kind of things they had to do once they came into the church, all right? But these people, they wanted to hear more about the Lord, and so they 
the, by the time we get to the next Sabbath day in verse 44, almost the whole city had come together to hear the word of God. And now the trouble starts. And where does it come from? It comes here from the Jewish people, okay, from those that did not want to hear. And the reason they didn't want to hear was envy. Okay? Envy. Right? They looked and they saw, wait a minute. Um, we don't get a hundred people coming to listen in, um, in the church on, when I'm preaching. I'm just going to make it personal now, right? I can hear them saying, hey, wait a minute. When I preach, there's only ten people here. But when evangelist so-and-so and so-and-so comes in, we get a hundred. What happens? Envy starts to come in. Right? They forget why are we here in the first place. Right? It's to hear the word of God. And so what was happening here, the Jewish people started to say, uh, they're stealing our crowd. They're stealing our thunder. They're, people are going to listen to them. They're not going to listen to us. We can't have that happen. And we see this happen over and over and over again. But it's the unfortunate part, as far as I'm concerned, is it's really God's chosen people that are the most hard-hearted, you know, that are the thick-headed, that don't want to accept Jesus as their Savior. And so they cause a ruckus, if you read on here, right? And they start, you know, to speak against Paul and Barnabas. And, and then Paul and Barnabas, they leave and they go somewhere else. And the same people, they cause another ruckus. You see, the devil isn't going to leave God's people alone. But God's people have to be confident to call upon the Lord to lead and guide them. And this is where I see, again, Paul and Barnabas are good examples. They're not in a rut. Sometimes they leave. Okay? Sometimes they, they leave the community that is giving them a hard time, and they go somewhere else. And other times, the Lord tells them to stay. And it doesn't sometimes seem to be logical. In our mind, it would, you know, you almost say, well, when this happens, and this happens, and this happens against me, then it's time for me to leave. Okay? But God says, no, maybe that happens, and that happens, and that happens in this different community, but I don't want you to leave yet. And so what we see is God was sharing the gospel, but most importantly, I want you to see this morning that God was leading those that were sharing the gospel. All right? So in some places they stayed, other places they left, some places they went back in again after they kicked them out. I mean, it was all really dependent on what the Lord told them to do. Like verse 51, I'll just close here now, you know. In some cases, like it says here, but they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. Right? So in one place they said, fine. Or I guess really, if I'm going to be really accurate, the Holy Spirit said, fine. If you don't want to accept, we're shaking the dust off of our feet. We're going to the next place. Okay. So what really we, I, you know, as I look at this, the importance of God's leading, and we're going to continue now the next weeks, moving through chapters and acts, and we're going to see God moving, we're going to see persecution when God moves, because the devil hates it when God moves, right? He doesn't want the church, I'm coming back, he doesn't want the church to be lizards. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Satan is quite happy with the church today being like a bunch of frogs, just stay in your lily pad, stay in your Bethel Tabernacle, stay in whatever church you want to put a name, it doesn't matter which one. Stay there. And once in a while, maybe a fly will come in, and you'll be happy about that. But I don't see the disciples staying. 
I didn't see Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't say, I'm setting up a church here, and I'm just going to sit here and wait for people to come to me. I didn't see, I don't see Jesus doing that. He was on the move. And his disciples and Paul, they went out all over the place, multiple journeys, right? And so we have to see from the examples of the scripture. I have to see from the examples of the scripture. And I was thinking, you know, about Pastor Mary. I have to confess to you. I was thinking about Pastor Mary, in particular in her early time of ministry. Pastor John talks about what? Camp meetings, right? She went to Quebec. She went into the States. She was here. She was there. They had meetings in Kitchener and Brother Park. You know, I don't know who was pastoring in the church at the time. Like when she was gone, I don't know how that worked. I'll have to ask Pastor John sometime about that. But my point is, and they did radio ministry, right? They were like lizards, as far as I'm concerned, right? And I'm using that in, as a picture. That were going out after the flies. They didn't just say, we're going to build a nice chapel, and now we're going to just stay here. Maybe they'll come in, maybe they won't come in. Eh, right? We'll see what happens. Well, I think we have to pray. Look at what the disciples are doing under the Holy Spirit's direction. That's so important. I'm not going to do anything unless the Holy Spirit directs. Right? But once he says, now, then we all have to be ready to jump. May the Lord bless you. Let's go have a wonderful service together, praising the name of the Lord. Amen.